Welcome to the Simpler Business Podcast, where we talk about ways to do what you love and serve your people in a way that brings you income and freedom. I'm your host, Marissa Roberts. Join me as I chat with my favorite entrepreneurs about how they simplify their biz so that you can simplify yours. We're talking about creativity today because creatives are often undervalued and restrained. People think being creative is a soft skill, a nice thing to do, but they don't consider it a business builder and they're wrong. Whether you work for yourself or for a company, your creativity is one of your most powerful assets. Companies and corporations suffer from high turnover, lack of job ownership and loss of profits because they focus on enforcing how someone else did the job before their new hire and stifling all ability to let employees adjust their job to work better individually, providing higher efficiency, pride in their work and overall happiness with their job. Employees are humans, not machines. And for business owners, creativity is a must if you're looking to stand out and really connect with your customers. The ability to think outside the box can transform your brand, making it more relatable and memorable to your target audience. Embracing creativity leads to innovative approaches to marketing, product development, and customer experience, not to mention increased engagement and loyalty. In a marketplace where consumers are bombarded with choices, letting creativity lead the way can be your best strategy to capture attention and drive your business success. My guest today is on a mission to inspire and empower creatives with the tools they need to be successful and to teach corporations to embrace the creativity of their employees. Paul Pape is a seasoned artist, designer, and entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience in the creative industry. Paul's journey began with a passion for education stemming from a need to escape an abusive childhood. Eventually, he found his way to design and fabrication, which led to creation of thousands of personalized products for clients worldwide. In recent years, Paul has pivoted to empowering fellow creatives, sharing his expertise and insights to help them transform their passions into successful businesses, which I am totally all here for. As a speaker, educator, and mentor, Paul inspires others to unleash their creative potential and find fulfillment in their personal and professional lives. Paul, welcome. I am very excited to have you here today. Thank you so much. What a a great introduction. I always listen to these and I'm like, I can't wait to meet this person. Wait, that's me. (laughs) What an amazing individual. Oh, hang on. I did all those things. I know. So true. And I think, you know what? Actually, I think that's a really good point. So many of us and our listeners, if you're listening to this and you haven't recognized this about yourself yet, write your own, like write a nice bio or get a friend to write a bio based on the things you actually have done in your life. And you'll see you're just as amazing. Like we don't give ourselves credit for all the stuff we've done sometimes because we're so focused on helping other people, right? Absolutely. One of my favorite quotes is your ordinary is someone else's extraordinary. And we often lose sight of that when we when we think about it especially in the creative industries you know my wife she's a costume designer i'm i make all this fun stuff behind me and we often forget when we're when we're talking to our children or we're talking to colleagues we're like yeah we just do this one thing and it's ah, i was whatever or they're like oh that was wonderful what you did and like eh it's like stop doing that like say thank you yes it is (laughs) i know we have a tendency uh to devalue our own skill when other people really just you know not everybody finds what we find easy easy and i think sometimes we forget to do that i remember when i first started my very first business beautifully organized and it was a business where i'd go into other mums' houses and i'd organize them not for that kind of pinterest perfect look because i have no design skills whatsoever but the whole goal was to make their day easier with young children. Like here's how to set up the kitchen so you can do dinner at witching hour really fast. Or here's how to set up the bathroom so you can clean it really fast, you know, and not spend hours in there. And I remember people saying to me like, oh, you've just got such a knack for that. But to me, it just felt like, no, I'm actually not doing anything special. Like I actually feel bad that you're paying me for it. Like why? Why was I saying that? (laughs) I just totally devalued it, but it actually helped other people. It's nuts. Exactly. Exactly. But, but you're in it. And that's a, that's a large part of what I talk about is, is a lot of people, especially when you're working for yourselves, um, you're inside of a bottle and you can't read the label. You don't understand what all you're contributing because you're in it. 
And it's only when you can see it from an outside perspective, like listening to you read that intro, it's like, wow, I've done a lot. And you don't think about it because you're, you're literally in it. And it's only until you can reflect that you really have the opportunity to see like everything that you've managed to touch in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I feel like oh, it's like a massive thing just to take away from the episode alone. <laughs> we haven't even officially <laughs> jumped in yet. <laughs> All right. Let's talk a bit, a little bit more about your history. You've okay. had a fascinating journey from creating personalized products to empowering creatives. So that's a very big shift in your business. And I love that you, you part of your mission is to actually teach businesses to embrace creativity. So what was the turning point that made you realize that you were so passionate to help others tap into their creative potential? I, it, there was a, there was a lot of them in, um, I don't know if you know the the analogy of the 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 there's like the feather and then the brick and then the truck. <laughs> like it's like sometimes the the universe is like, hey, you should try this, and you're like, no, 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 and then it like hits you a little bit harder, and then eventually it just like really smacks you upside the face. So for a long time, I uh, went wherever I went, I people would ask me, hey, Paul, how would you do dot dot dot? I've got a really weird like mind for problem solving, and I, I'm. I'm I, I like to, my title is creative problem solver, but that's really, really, really too broad for a lot of people. But uh, like I'd go to the chiropractor just to get an adjustment and he would ask, he's like, okay, I've got my three questions for you while you're here. And they'd be about electri electricity or they'd be about computer problems or about how his wife should run the bookstore. I'm mean, like, just random things. And I would get these questions all the time from all these people. And, I'm, and I, would, I would just answer them because I'm, I'm a person who wants to please other people. You know, I think we all fall into that trap being yeah. a people pleaser. Um, and then, uh, recently, like the biggest, the big, the truck, uh, was, I was working on a job for Disney and they had a, a, I had shipped them, uh, I live in the middle of the United States and I had shipped them to a coast and of course nothing survived shipping. So a couple pieces had broken and they flew me out there cause it was cheaper to fly me out there to fix them than it was to ship it back and forth. And I was sitting in this office surrounded by the most, a lot like this, the most beautiful props and stuff imaginable from the industry. And I was there fixing the pieces that I had created that had broken. And I took a selfie of myself and then I sent it to my wife and she's like, you look miserable. And she's like, you're, you're doing, <laughs> you're in this place that is like your playground. This is the thing that you, that you live for and you just look miserable. And I, and I actually looked at the photo and I'm like, I think you're right. Because it was, it was a, it was a point where I had spent 20 years making everyone else's dreams come true. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what about mine? You know, and, and, and it seems selfish, but at the same time, I'm like, what do I really want out of it? Like what part of, like, I can make anything, but what do I really get out of it? And I've had people ask me, you know, what's the favorite thing you've ever made? What's the, your, your, your best project? And I'm, and I always like reflexively say, it's never really the product. It's always the thing that I learned or the journey that I went on and all that. And I'm like, why, do, why am I not pursuing that as a career, you know, and then, and pursuing like the thing that makes me happy, which is also answering all the questions for everybody. And I was like, well, why don't, why don't I do that? And so that's really what it was. And then I thought, they're already asking me the questions. So why don't we try and instead of doing it person by person, because you can't affect that many people on an individual basis. Why don't we broaden it out and see if I can go to a company, I can talk to hundreds of people. If I go to, if I talk to one executive, that trickle down effect is going to be a lot better than me just talking to a single individual about them pursuing their personal answers. And um, like you said before, like I jumped into education to escape all of this and Education has become such a cornerstone. It is the religion of my of my life. Like education is my thing. And I think that everyone should love to learn like I do. And I find that you don't have to love the, pro the process of learning, the educate, the schooling in it. You don't have to love that, but you have to love the thing that you want to learn. And, and I have found that so many people will dive deeply into something that they're passionate about. And that love can be moved to air uh, to you know, whatever it is that you're interested in. And so I thought, well, why not go and pursue people's pers you know, pursuance of creativity? I'm like, let's find the thing that you're passionate about. And let me show you how to turn that into your life instead mm -hmm. of just, instead of just doing the thing that you like. And then I've got this thing on the side that brings me joy. Why don't we bring joy to your entire life? I love that. And I think that's such a big thing because 
when people have the opportunity to tap into something that really lights them up, right, then the better they feel, the more they can help people anyway, because it's not just that one-on-one factor anymore. It's like this, when I work with people who are doing something that's really aligned with like a natural interest or a talent or a skill, like something that's just the right fit, it's like it radiates out of them and they have such a good influence on the people around them without even realizing. It's not even a structured thing at that point. It's like they're just doing good all over the place accidentally and it's a beautiful thing to watch. That accident, I love that accidental. It is, it is, there's like, we, we just don't recognize because we're in it that, that how much that joy can actually be focused. And then it is, it's an internalized, once we internalize it, we do radiate it. And you've been, everybody has encountered that one person. It's like, why are you so like, why do I want to be around you? Why am I like attracted to you? Not, not in any kind of relationship way, but just like, I, I need to be around that person because there's something going on or, you know, like, infectious like i i do a, a speech i get on stages and i was talking about creativity and i was in a room full of people who are not creative <laughs> and at the end they stood up and they went i want to be creative you have like because i'm so enthusiastic about it and I, I'm, I'm such so passionate about others being creative and it was like but what i took away from that was you are creative you just don't understand that it's people view creativity as art Mm-hmm. It's like, no, creativity is anything that you have that where you have passion. And like, I, I know programmers like the, or tax preparers, like you should see me nerd out on taxes. I love preparing taxes for, it's such a weird thing, but I'm like very passionate about it. But that's, it's creativity because something in you has sparked this love, this joy for it. And anybody's job or thing that they find passionate it doesn't have to be art. It can be anything in their, in their life. And as long as you nurture that, I think your life just becomes much more fulfilled and people are attracted to that. Yeah, I think you're right. It's like what I do with this business, right? On the surface level, it kind of feels like it's all going to be simplifying how you run your business. It's all going to be systems and processes and blah, blah, blah. And it sounds really boring, but life is anything but because I am so excited about how do I free up this pocket of time? How do I do this in 10 minutes instead of an hour? How do I have more time for all the other stuff that I enjoy that kind of fills my cup or bucket or whatever the saying is, right? It's mm-hmm. like the percep- perception of, of what you're doing just completely changes. When Think about like cake makers, for example, people who baked cakes in the 70s and 80s. It wasn't the art form that a lot of, I mean, you can still bake a simple cake now and be happy, but look at the art form that cake baking has become. That's, it's amazing. Or people who are just, you know, baby showers, for example, or the office jobs, like even some stuff that you say, I don't know if you spend a lot of time on TikTok. But I do. I pretend it's work-related. It's really not. I just really like being on TikTok as a consumer. And the things, you know, people doing roof cleaning, for example, that have turned that into a creative, entertaining thing to watch. And it's really, you're just watching them clean roofs. Like, there's nothing Mm -hmm. special. They're not doing it in a costume. They're not doing it to music. No one's dancing on the rooftop. But it's so satisfying to watch it because they have, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like they've found this little pocket of creativity that they can align with something that they already, you know, they're doing anyway. So, um, yeah, I really love it. My youngest son has this game that he plays on the computer. It is called Power Wash Simulator where he literally power washes things. And he'll spend hours at it. And it's the satisfaction of seeing a job well done. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, I, I totally relate to that. It's like, yeah, you'll want, or even cooking. Like I like, I like to eat um, and I'm okay at cooking, but to watch somebody who's got the the creativity behind it and to, to the ease at which they do it or pottery. I, I have a friend who is a, who throws pottery and she just whips this stuff out like magic. And we're like, you're an earthbender. She's like, ah, it's just my work. And I'm like, stop that. No, it's it. Cause it is, it's just, she just makes it look so effortless. And then somebody will come next and it's like, Oh, you make it look so easy. And then they try it and they're like, no. <laughs> so it's so, it <laughs> is very nice to sit and watch that. Yeah. 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 And you know what? I think too, because you've worked in a, across multiple industries, right? So Disney and then individual artists and, you know, multiple ranges of, of topics really that businesses are built around. How do you adapt your approach to bringing that creativity into those scenarios when they can all be so different when you're working with people? I think the biggest thing is 
first of all, I approach every problem the same way. It's like, what are we trying to get out of it? And whether you're a business and you know, you, you're trying to launch a new product or you're trying to keep people from quitting, or you're a person who, who wants to have something uh, memorialized, I think it always comes down to like, what is the problem that we're trying to get to? And then we work backwards from there. I, th I think that's the, 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 the best way. But it, at the end of the day, we're just dealing with humans and um, I've yet to create a project for a non-human. I mean, I've done <laughs> urns and stuff for animals, but I'm like, you know, then they're, they're not my clientele. And so when it comes, when it comes down to it, we're, we're building things for people. And my wife once told me, she goes, you, your job is to make memories tangible. Mm. And I'm like, well, that's a really nice way of saying, saying that. And, and that's what I do is, and I think the easiest approach to that with doesn't matter who the clientele is, it's to ask questions and then to actually listen to the answers. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times when we get into work mode, we, we already know, we know how we're going to do it. And we're not open to the left turns that might happen when you're actually investigating. Because I've had clients come up to me and it's like, we would really like to have this. And they're very set in their ways. And I'm like, okay, why are we trying to get to that? What, what is it about that that is important? And then they start to talk about it. And then they're trying to bring in feelings. And we think, oh, they think the customer's going to like this. And I'm like, well, instead of that one thing, which is very, very specific to you as the person who's trying to pitch this, but you're trying to reach a broader audience, what if we did this? And you, and you know you've hit the nail on the head when their eyes get big, their mouth opens a little bit, and they're like, yes. you know, And it's like... It's, so it's it's listening to the answers to the questions that you ask. And I think that we have gotten away. We always want to fill the air and we're always waiting to answer. We're not waiting. We're not listening. And it really is about just, you know, let me sit back and, and, and see what you have to say. And then I think while you might have an idea of what you want, I can use my expertise to actually see if we can distill down what it is, the core of what it is that you actually want, and then make the best version of that. Yeah. I really, really love how it's, it's like you view your job as not instilling creativity in somebody, but unlocking the creativity that's already in there that they might not even realize is in there. Absolutely. And we are all passionate people, <laughs> whether, whether we want to uh, think about it or not. I mean, I've spent it's been too many years thinking I was just this robot who could make the things that people wanted instead of being the human that is helping people unlock all of this. And I think once it actually occurred to me that, you know, I, I am trying to help all of these people find their humanity, find their creativity inside of them. I'm like, the only way you can do that, there's no machine that can do that for you. A human has to do it. And it, it, it's a beautiful thing to see someone's expression when they, when that intangible be, is placed in front of them. Like you, you mentioned that I've worked for thousands of people and, and I have, and, and usually like the most popular thing right now for me is uh, custom engagement ring boxes that are themed out. So two people who know each other better than, and I don't know them at all, they come together and, and it's like, I would like to propose and we really set, we, we met over this or we celebrate with this and I've done some really wacky things that I would never think that this would be the thing that would, you know, excite them, but it has become this cherished thing. And 15, 17, 18 years later, they'll reach out and be like, I don't know if you remember me, but I, you made, and I'm like, I remember every single one of you. I have photos of all of them. And I'm like, and the fact that they still cherish it, it sits on a shelf. It has a place of honor because when they look at that, they see memories. And yeah. I think it's, it's very, it's, it's such an emotional thing and such a great gift to be able to give people. Yeah. You know, it makes me wonder at how many people are out there who are touching other people and helping create meaningful moments like that, that don't even realize that they're doing it right. Just in their everyday work that they do. It's amazing. I, I've definitely, I've run across to those people and, and they don't, again, your ordinary is someone else's extraordinary, the, the, a friendly smile, a way to say thank you. One of my favorite things to do when, especially when I'm traveling is I find the person whose job is very difficult for them to deal because they're dealing with a lot of people in stressful situations. And I love to tell them, thank you for what you do. Mm. And I think that that's an important thing to say because you can, we all say thank you, but it's, it's just a thing that we say. It's just a, it's a, it's a response, but to say thank you for what you do 
is such a, and I've had people, like I had a bus driver once on it. It was driving around the airport, but it was 30 below zero. It was freezing. He had to have the door open the entire time. And he's just shuttling angry people who are freezing to different parts of the airport. And I got it to him and I go, thank you for what you do. And he's like, yeah, what? Oh, you're welcome. And I'm like that simple little bit of an interaction. It's like, you don't understand like how much it, it can, it can affect somebody and a simple wave, a simple thank you. It just, it goes so far and people will remember it for a very long time. It's the thing that lifts them up. Yeah, they really do. I think you're right too. There's lots of little moments where I've realized in the past couple of years that when hurdles pop up, you know, you might have somebody who's not particularly happy about you, how you've handled something or they've missed out on something or some, something has not happened that's not great. I used to, I I'm, I'm was naturally a ghoster because I'm a people pleaser by nature. And if someone's not happy, I can't handle that. And I don't like confrontation. And so that was a really big thing for me to get past. And I've realized in the last couple of years that actually when, when hurdles pop up, especially where people are emotional about them, they just, they just want someone to care. That's all it is. Every time. It doesn't matter what led them there. They just really want someone to care about them. And I feel like that was a huge aha moment for me to be able to handle that sort of stuff. And, you know, there's no, I mean, yes, there are bad people out there, but most people aren't horrible people. Like their mum loves them. There's something about them. <laughs> You know what I mean? And so even just even just that that side of using your creativity to be like, hang on a minute, what can I notice that other people don't normally notice? And what's going to make their day? And often I, th I have a feeling you don't do it deliberately. I don't think you're sitting on that, that shuttle bus going, right, how can I make this day a little bit better for that driver? I think you're just going up there going, you know, showing that moment of appreciation. And then that, that flow on effect that that's going to have on his interaction with the next people and theirs with other people, that's a magical thing, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. So when people think business, they tend to think corporate or they tend to think big, strong, making lots of money, you know, I, I very much a... I guess rigid might be the word I'm looking for there. And I think, you know, what's so interesting about you is you you have a way of being able to being able to bring more creativity and kind of loosen that structure in a way, but not in a way that that, you know, it's know not threatening. Yes, exactly. What do you think? I mean, I imagine you've come across a lot of common like misconceptions in the business world about what creative creativity to can bring to business if you know what i mean that was a terrible way to ask that question but yeah what have you <laughs> what have you noticed in terms of that i think the biggest misconception is and you touched on it a little bit in the introduction is that um people are not cookie we're not machines we are humans and um, my, one of my favorite things to do when I go to vis visit a business that that I'm, I'm talking to them, I'm like, let me see your training videos. And they're like, why? And I'm like, I just want to see them. And the reason is, is, is I call it the, the Montel Jordan's greatest hits is this is how we do it. And it's like, no, <laughs> this is not how we do it, guys. And the problem is, is that at one point there was somebody who was super creative at their job and they figured out how to do it so well that somebody who has no idea how they do their job was like, we're going to film you doing your job and you're going to train everyone else. And that person's like, this is the best compliment ever. Absolutely. And then it's like making photocopies of photocopies. Eventually the creativity is gone. And now we're just trying to shove ourselves into these boxes made by someone else who was truly creative. Yeah. And the misconception is that we can do that and it'll be efficient and people will be fulfilled. And it, it isn't. When I go into business, I, I will look at the training videos because I want to see their, con like, we all have, like, you get a job, you have something you have to accomplish. That's great. We all understand that. But how you get from A to B can be, there's a, a different way. There's so many different ways to do it. And that little bit of of ownership that you can get by figuring it out, your process by your, you know, figuring out and doing it the way that you do it. So that eventually you can become the person who they're like, you know how to do this job. It gives so much more pride to people. We always equate success with, with the metric of money. And 
as an as an artist, not just a creative, but as an artist, money is like one of those, it's the forbidden topic. It's the thing that, you know, it's like, oh, I don't, and that's why the giveaway is what it is because it's about worth. But when you're in a job, I understand if I come into a corporate environment that I'm not going to be like, okay, all your creatives need to be paid a lot more because they're the ones who are thriving your business. It, it, the, the, they're like, nah, it's not going to happen. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to give them something that has value. And there are two things that have absolute value. Oh, three, if you count money itself, but the two things that have the absolute value is time and ownership of your job. The pride that you get from doing a job where you can express yourself in the way that you, you need to, that, that you can show your creativity. And then I have yet to meet somebody who is really good at their job and, and it takes the same amount of time after doing it for five years that it did when it started. Like when you are good at your job, you become faster at it. You become more efficient unless you're Montel Jordan in it over here and you're being forced to do it a very particular way. I've got a good friend of mine who works at this company and I was talking to him about it the other day and he goes, yeah, he's got to be at the office for eight hours. He does one hour of work a day. And he says, I spent seven hours on YouTube. He goes, I have become really good at watching YouTube and not getting caught, <laughs> be, be, which is, which is horrible. It's a horrible waste of time, but his management feels that he has to be, we, we have to watch you nice to stuff. make sure that you're being productive. Yeah. But instead of saying, this is, this is the task. This is, this is the solution that we're after. Get there. However you get there, that's fine. And so I like to encourage, and it often it's like a 50-50 on this one, but I like to encourage them to say, if your employees can get to the task and get it accomplished in that hour, let them go. Mm -hmm. Don't deplete the money because you should be more efficient. The longer you do something, you should be faster at it. Don't pile on more work because then that, that that is not a reward. The reward for that will be, I will work slower then, or I'll fake my way through YouTube for seven hours. Yeah. The, the reward has to be, give them something back. Time is our most valuable asset. I mean, if you had more money, what, what does that do? You spend that to give yourself more time to do other things. As you mentioned, I want to work one to two hours a day. I don't want to work 10, 12 hours a day because time is valuable. Yeah. And so those three things, if you can't give them money, then give them ownership of their job, they'll still get it done and then give them some time back. And if you absolutely have to give them, you know, have to have them contain for eight hours, like we're zoo people, which is weird, um, then you give them something else, give them a reason to want to be there too. And, and responsibility and ownership is, is the best way to do it. Yeah. I think that's such a good point. And to, and when you think about it from a business owner's perspective, because a lot of our listeners are solo business owners, right? And they know what that's like to work for a company and had to kind of fudge their work day because, you know, I mean, people are having six coffees a day, they're chatting at other people's work desks and it, it looks like they're busy, right? But yeah, I, I, I love your friend. I think he's amazing. And I'm a really big believer in if you can get that work done, don't be... Um, punished for your efficiency don't be punished for your talent and your skill mm -hmm. like just just be impressed and enjoy it and and give them a reward for it instead and when i work with um clients who are service providers in particular and they go yeah i'm working on an hourly rate and i think like i'm not saying an hourly rate is bad but if you can shift to a package and tell your client this is the outcome you're going to get every month from me and this is the retainer that i'm going to charge you for that you could get that work done in three hours instead of 10 hours and your client's not going to mind because you're giving them the outcome that you've promised them. They're not tracking. Clients are busy. That's why they're outsourcing to you. They're not tracking the minutes that you're working. And if they are tracking the minutes that you're working, they're not an ideal client because they're really not focused on the outcome that you can deliver to them. So yeah, when I, when I say to people that I take Thursdays off to go to the movies while everybody else is at work and at school and I like to go to gold class and go on the recliner and just feel like, Oh, my life is amazing. And that's a staple in my week now because, you know, you do, we do, we help other people in lots of different ways. I like that couple of hours to myself and people are like, what on a Thursday in the middle of the day? What do your clients think? My clients don't mind because I role model that they don't have to be chained to their desks 24 seven either. So yeah, I'm very passionate about that too.
it's it's important. There's a great story about Pablo Picasso. He's in, and I don't. It's probably made up at this point, but there's a he's sitting on a park bench, and a woman comes up to him and goes, "Hey, are you Pablo Picasso?" He's like, "Yes, I am." Oh, I love your work. Blah blah blah. Would you draw my picture? He's like, absolutely, and he takes out a pad of paper. He puts three lines on the paper, and he hands it over to her. She's like, "That's amazing." He goes, "That'll be ten thousand dollars." She's like, but that's only three lines and it took you no time. He's like, no, it's three lines. And it took me 40 years to learn how to put those three lines where they are. Yeah. And that's really the, the answer. Efficiency should not be punished. And I a hundred percent agree with that. And yeah. when we do, when it is that like we humans will do, we'll do what we want. Like we will become really efficient at hiding yeah. what what we're doing and like we're gonna we'll 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 game the system there's no fixing that i thought covid was probably while it was a horrific thing that happened worldwide it, it really opened up humanity's eyes to what we've actually been forced into labor wise yeah. <laughs> to these work days these work offices when we had to work from home people are like I don't have to put on pants and I can still get my job done. I get it done in three hours. I can go play with my dog. Uh, I can binge watch some television. And the job was still getting done. And the employers are like, well, you can't come into the office, but you're still being efficient. You're still getting your 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 tasks are complete. Awesome. And But now we're getting right back into that. Oh, well, we're back. paying for this building. You got to come back in here. And now we're all like, and we're, and we're back to lying. And, yeah. and it's like, if you just... Give them a little bit, give them a little bit of freedom. You would be surprised because if, if you cut their day even by one hour so that they have that little bit of extra freedom or you let, let them have a two hour lunch, yeah. you know, what that will do is that gives them a motivation to come back in, you know, yeah. because if I, it, like, I don't, I don't want to sit in rush hour traffic at eight, eight o'clock in the morning. Cause I got to be to the office by nine. If you're like, look, I know you can get your job done in four hours. Come in at 11. Yes. Sweet. Have a I can sit here and drink my coffee. Yeah. It just yeah. makes, it makes it so much easier. And this, but, but I will, I will speak to the opposite of that as solopreneurs, as entrepreneurs, as people who own their own businesses, keep that in mind. You will own a business. And let me tell you, you can fill 18 hour days yeah. easily running your own business. But, but, and I used to say this a lot to uh, students when I was a college professor, no good work comes after a certain amount of time. Usually, like I know people say, I do all nighters. I'm like, why? Mm -hmm. We're all gremlins at midnight. We all turn into monsters. It's not, nothing good is going to come after midnight. Okay. And so plan, plan your time. And let me tell you that work will always be there. Uh-huh. Yeah. Unless I remember you're really up against a, de a deadline. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I first started shortening my work days on purpose, it was because I was wasting time. I was procrastinating. I was putting off the important stuff till the end of the day. And then I was really cranky, even though I love my work. I was still like, oh, it's 4 p.m. And now I have to blah, blah, blah. And so I started telling myself the very first step was I shaved an hour of Friday afternoons. And I remember thinking that day, you know, this has actually forced me to choose what the most important and urgent tasks are so that I can at least get those done and then the rest can wait till Monday. And the difference was amazing. I got more work done under the pump having one hour less and then I had the most enjoyable afternoon that I'd had in two years. It's like that whole perspective change, it's, yeah, I, I wish. And I think you write about COVID times, you know, we had, everybody was locked in their house for so long, but the creativity that came out of that, the way people were working, the way people were managing having children at home with them while they were working, the 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 way they systemized things like even just, you know, this is a terrible example, but, you know, people who are like, oh, you know, my work's tracking me based on how many mouse clicks I'm doing, like the way they've set up them, <laughs> hack their mouse. Yeah. The, the way people exploded on TikTok because they would share those little creative hacks and then they didn't even need the job anyway because they were making money off TikTok. I'm like, this opened up a whole new world. And, yeah, I totally feel, what, feel where you're coming from in terms of people not wanting to go back to the office because, you know, you know and it's not just the commute. It's now they're having to pay for childcare again. They're having to pay really high petrol prices. They're having to pay for parking. They're having to pay for lunches out. They show up to the office. No one's there anyway because only mm -hmm. three people are scheduled on that day and they're on Zoom calls all day anyway. It's crazy. But, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like the more creativity we can unlock in people, the better. I saw this... Um, 
there was this classroom, you know, when they were all doing remote learning and there was a bunch of high schoolers who they had one kid who said, let's have fun with our teachers. And one of the things they'd realized is when they're on Zoom, it was like that Brady Bunch grid. You can see everybody's faces. And he's like, let's take a pen and pass it to each other and pass it down and pass it up and see if the teacher notices. And you know what? Every single kid turned up to class that day. And once they had that little laugh, everybody was engaged in the learning. And I'm like, see, that's a perfect example. We we will find we will find a way. Mm -hmm. We will. And to make the best of of the time that we have. And you know, uh, we have to work. It's just that it's just part of life. It really is. And if you enjoy what you do, and I do love my job, but it is still a job. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll say the same thing, but it's the times that we have in between those in, in let giving yourself, giving yourself the room to play. Very important. Uh, and have fun, you know, and we'll find ways to do it. I mean, I, I see people making sculptures out of staples and stuff like that, and, you know, from their work, whatever paper clips, things that they can make. We'll do all of these things because we need that outlet. We need that creative part of our, our life because we, we are not machines. We are human beings. And while the jobs need to be done, we need to still, there's humans that have to do it. Otherwise we'll let machines have the jobs. And, mm -hmm. and that's okay. In, in some jobs, that's perfectly rational. But for the ones that need that human touch, you've got to give them the room to grow, that little bit of ownership. I think it's very important. Yeah, exactly. I've had so much fun talking about this today, and I've only just realized I've gone like way over time. So I'm so sorry if you have to rush off. But before we wrap up, I do want to share, you've got a really good resource for people on how to figure out what to charge for creative. So do you mind if we talk about that briefly before we finish up? No, let's do this because it's one of the, the reason I even have this is because it is the question that I am asked the most. And I think it's very important for people because when, especially as, as creatives, uh, typically we have an output of something, whether it, and it's usually tangible. And that's what this will talk about is the tangible things. But if you have intangibles, like it fits advice or whatever, it will fit into this. Yeah. But the one thing that I found is universal with anybody who is creative is when they're figuring out what to charge, they figure out the material cost, what that costs them. And then they add 20% and they call it good. And I'm like, you're missing the most important thing. That's your time. Yeah. Like, what is your time? And they're like, well, but, but I love what I do. And I'm like, great, charge for it. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, please do that. And, but they're like, I don't know what to charge. I, what, what, what is my hourly rate? And the easiest way to do this is I, I feel, and it's a self-reflection thing is really what the, and you'll see this in the giveaway. There's a sliding scale at the bottom. It goes from one to 10. If you have a skill, that you are trying to monetize, this is your job, then you're going to at least be at five. And if you're just starting off, that's where you're going to be. You're in dead center because if you're before five, you're still in the learning process. And sometimes you'll get hired for a job and you're like, I don't necessarily know how to do that. I like to dip myself a little under five and I call that the education tax. You know, it's like, I'm going to charge a little bit less, but I'm going to learn something. So the next time I can charge more. Yeah. And so we start at five and five is minimum wage for a cost of, for being able to, to live in the area that you live. Yep. And I think that's the, the most important because if you're selling something and you're making less than you will going to work at a minimum wage job in your area, go work at the minimum wage job in the area. Yeah, that's a really good point. And then from there, what we do is we, we account for that time thing. The, the longer you are doing something, the faster, more efficient you should be. And so then you're going to start to move up that scale. And what I say is when you start moving up, when you go from a five to a six, you double your hourly rate because you should be having your time. Mm -hmm. And people are like, whoa, that's, that seems crazy to go from making $12 an hour to $24 an hour. And I'm like, okay, well, lawyers charge $500 an hour. Yeah. But that's because as you get faster, why should the you five years from now make less money in the same amount of, you know, in doing, because they're working less hours. Why should they make less money than the, the you of right now who's doesn't know what they're doing, who's earning minimum wage, but it takes you 10 hours to do something when the guy five years down the line is doing it in two. Yeah. It shouldn't, they should be making more money. So they need to charge, but you're being more efficient and it's figuring yourself out on that scale is super important, but that is a personal introspective thing. And I, I've ran into those people who are like, I'm just starting out, but I'm a nine. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> like, come on, back <laughs> it down. Because you got to have room to grow. You know, like I've been doing this for 20 years. And let me tell you, when I started off, I thought I was an eight. And I'm like, I got the skills and I couldn't sell anything. 
And it mm-hmm. wasn't until I dropped my rates down because nobody knows who you are. And so then, okay, well, I dropped my rate down. I started really work. I was working a lot, but I was, and then I started to raise the prices. And I noticed that the work kept coming in. I'm working faster. And I went from doing 60, 80 hour weeks to now I work 12 hours a week is what I work now, which is, yeah. which is great. Make, I make more money than I've ever made before. And yeah. that is important. But then, so that's, that's the, the first one is minimum wage. If you're starting out, like, and then find your sliding scale. So that's your hourly. You gotta, gotta keep that. Your material costs are going to be your material costs. And let me tell you, if materials are going up and they are worldwide, your prices need to increase. We're seeing that everywhere when we go to buy anything as a creative, as a person who is runs their own business, you need to account for that as well. We all understand it's happening and don't think that you're going to lose business because you have to raise prices because it costs you more to operate. It, it is the nature of the game. Yeah. But the most important part that I love to stress on this is you got to tack on a profit. Mm. Most people, they're like, okay, well, I'm charging my hourly and I'm getting my materials. We're good. And I'm like, well, if you lose your hands today, but you've already sold that job, you're going to have to give that hourly to someone else. Mm -hmm. And the material cost is already gone. Where are you making your money? That's profit. And if you're not making profit, you've got a lovely hobby. Yes. And don't feel bad about making profit. Everyone assumes (laughs) you're making profit anyway, right? So (laughs) if you don't allow for the profit, and your client thinks you're making profit anyway, like nobody wins, nobody wins. And yeah, I just, that's the part that gets me is a lot of business owners I work with, especially in that first couple of years, they're like, I just, you know, I just need to get my name out there. I just need to prove what I'm doing. And I'm like, well, you also have to eat at the same time. And you also have to make savings for your future. It's not just about, I can live on $500 a week. So I should aim for $500 a week. No, you're always going to be working like that hamster on the treadmill or whatever it is. You're never going to get off at that point and you're going to burn out. I burnt out three months into my professional organizing career. I burnt out. It was super ironic that I was helping other people make their day easier. And I was coming home exhausted, couldn't play with my own kids and my house was a mess. It's just you know, same thing. Cause I did that exact same thing. I was pricing, didn't even start at minimum wage. I went with, what do I think the customer's going to pay for this? And then I went with, what are other people charging and how can I go under? So they'll pick me. No wonder it didn't work. Yeah. And I think we get into that mindset of like, well, if I, if I'm charging too much, then the, the people won't buy from me. Mm. I think the best way to avoid that is it's first off, if they don't want to pay you what you're worth, they are not your client. Yeah. And be comfortable with that. It is better to say no and and wait for the client who who will respect you. A great example of this is I when I first started off, I was charging fifty dollars for a sculpture, a sculpture that would take me ten hours. I was making five five dollars an hour, and that's my labor. Like I was making no profit, anything like that. And what I found is I wasn't selling very much. I was like, why, why am I not selling it? These are dirt cheap. I raised my prices to a hundred dollars, and they started going like hotcakes because they're like, oh, that. It costs more. It has value. Yeah. Yep. It's when it's too cheap. People are like, it's too cheap. Eh. You know, like if you were cleaning people's houses or organizing their homes and you're like, I'm going to do it for 20 bucks. They're going to be like, I don't want a $20 job. I want a hundred dollar job. I'd rather yep. pay somebody who's going to charge me more because I know it's going to be done right. And exactly. it's like, no, no, I'm doing it right. Just hire me. No. If they're not yep. going to pay, they're not your client. It's okay. It's- it's like that barbershop, right? That had a competitor open across the street and their sign said, we do cheap haircuts. And so he put up a sign that said, we fix cheap haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you got to think of it. You got to value yourself before anybody else is going to value you too. That perceived value is such a big thing. So, And you oh, can deliver on it. If you're passionate about what you do, <clears throat> you can certainly deliver on that value. And if you're not undercharging, then you actually have the energy, you're not, you know, you're not doing a hundred jobs when you really should be focused on three jobs. So you have the energy to deliver a better outcome for your client anyway. So yeah, totally worth it. You go, I was going to interrupt you. (laughs) When you are, because like you said, like with your job, you work so much to try and prove that you're as good as you are and that, that you're willing to do it for anything that you'll, that, that spark, that passion, that thing that draws people to you, that energy that you have, it'll disappear. It yeah. will go away and you'll need to recharge that. And you don't want to lose the thing that makes you passionate. And so do less, but do it with more passion and the jobs will come. Yeah, You will be scared to death 
<laughs> that you will not ever work again. <laughs> I've been at this for 20 years. I still think that from time to time. I, I know by tracking my numbers and all this that there are slow times in the year. And every time I get into those, I think to myself, well, this is done. I might as well just go out and get a job at McDonald's now. You know, it's like, no. You got You just have to know that this is the cycle that it goes through, and to stay stay true to it, and and recharge yourself in those times where you're where you're not working super hard. Work hard on improving yourself to make yourself better, so that the product that you're putting out is even better. Yeah, exactly. Well, this has been amazing. I'm going to make sure I've got a link in the show notes to that resource because to see that printed on paper is such a big eye opener and. You know, it's one thing to hear about it, but it's another thing to actually put it into action, right? So I find your document is very supportive. It walks them through, you know, how to do that hourly rate, how not to do that hourly rate. What do you do when you're worried about, you know, am I going to lose clients, that sort of thing? Yeah, it's very, very helpful. So I'm going to link to it in the show notes. Do you have also a favorite social media platform or if somebody wants to chat from like chat with you and learn more about you, is your website the best option? Are you on socials? Where can they find you? Um, my art is everywhere under Paul Pape Designs. Mm -hmm. And so if you are interested in any of a, a cool thing, a, a tangible memory, if you're interested in that, Paul Pape Designs is a good place to find me. And I'm on all social medias as Paul Pape Designs. If you're interested in, in learning the coaching part of it or the, the, the teaching part of it, it's called Paul Pape It. It's paulpape.it because that's what I want you to do. I want you to do it how I do it, Paul Pape It. So just <laughs> paulpape.it. Love it. All right. I'll make sure we've got some links in the show notes for that as well. Thank you so much for being here. This has been such a fun and enlightening conversation. So I really appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, it's been great. I, lo I love doing these. These are so much fun. <laughs> love talking about it. Y'all can talk about this stuff for hours. And guys listening out there, I hope that you have enjoyed the conversation as much as I have enjoyed having it with Paul. If you want to know anything else about this topic, Get in touch with both of us and let us know too. And I, I always like to say to people, just whether it's a DM or a review or an email, let me know if you're if there's something in particular that you want to talk about, you want us to look into for you, because the topics that we talk about on this podcast, I want them to be relevant to you so that you're not wasting an hour. You know, conversations like this can help spark the rest of your week. So if there's something in particular that you want to know about, that you want to learn how to, you know, make easier or more efficient or make a bigger impact even, come and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And I will see you all in the next episode. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Simpler Business Podcast. If you did, please subscribe, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. There's a link in the show notes to make it nice and easy for you, just the way we like it. If you're ready to simplify and scale your business, you can get started with my free audio class at marissaroberts.com. See you next time.